Good evening, everyone, and uh, happy Madraka Day. I welcome you to this webinar session tonight. Uh, as you all know, today, uh, topic, we are going to be handling plant protection. And uh, by starting by a word of introduction, I'm Gideon and I'm part of SOCA. SOCA is a Society of Crop Agribusiness Advisors of Kenya. And uh, it's a pool of professionals in agriculture. It involves crop protection, crop as boundary. And uh, SOCA is open for membership. And uh, for further information, you can always reach out. It's open for people who are in agriculture. And so with us is the soccer chairman, Ms. Ariki. So Ms. Ariki, you're welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Gideon. So, so um, we are going ahead and uh, tonight we have our, uh, the person who is going to talk to us on plant uh, protection is Mr. Benson uh, Ngigi and he's a crop protection specialist with an over 17 years of experience in both the public and the private sector. So he has worked with various organizations in training of plant doctors and spray services. He's currently working with Double SK of Crop Life Kenya. So I take this opportunity to welcome Mr. Gigi to take us through this session. And uh, I would like uh, to make it clear that over the session, them that are live on other platforms, they can always post their questions. We are going to take the questions after the presentation. So thank you so much and welcome Mr. Gigi. Uh, thank you very much uh, Gideon for that introduction and uh, greetings to everyone who is listening to us. Uh, on Facebook uh, and uh, live on the on this webinar series. So today I'll be taking you through uh, plant protection and uh, what it talks and what it is all about. So welcome. Okay, so uh, plant protection is a, a very key component of uh, farming because uh, as we know uh, when we are doing our plant production there are pests that uh, will bother uh, our farming and uh, it is upon the farmer to undertake uh, measures which will uh, reduce the impact from the uh, pests and diseases which they will encounter uh, during the course of the season. Uh, you remember that some plants are annual, they go, they go for only one season and some are there in the farm for a longer period. And therefore we have to take into consideration uh, these uh, pests uh, to enable us to uh, achieve the optimum yields that uh, we expect from, from, from farming. Uh, the market also demands certain quality uh, standards and uh, they might be compromised by the pests and diseases that we we encounter on, on our farm. So uh, the first step when you are talking about plant protection is you have to be able to identify uh, the pests that are bothering you because you cannot go to uh, a war with them without first uh, understanding them and being able to uh, know how, how they behave. So uh, in uh, definition, a pest is any organism uh, which can cause harm to the plant 
development and can be uh, compromising the quantity and the quality of eels. When you talk of organisms, this can be mammals, they can be uh, invertebrates, and uh, they can also be plants as well. So uh, the, the spectrum of uh, pests is, uh, is quite large when you look at the uh, families that they belong to. So you can look and uh, see that the first kind of uh, pest that we might encounter are mites, uh, which are eight-legged arthropods, and they belong to the family Arachnida. When you look at it from uh, the, na the, the naming part of it, and uh, they mostly cause damage by piercing and sucking on the plants. So you'll f mostly find them aligned along the veins of the of the plant. Uh, from where they do the sucking. And uh, this has an impact on the plant because the plant will be extracting water from the soil, uh, developing or generating nutrients from the various uh, structures like the leaves. And uh, the mites will be there waiting and they will uh, take these nutrients for their own purpose. So, and this is where the problem comes in because the, the plant will be uh, actively generating the nutrients or the food, but the mites will be feeding on it and uh, thereby causing uh, the plant not to grow in a normal way. Uh, they are also disease vectors, especially for viruses. Uh, most of them are highly mobile. They'll move from one plant to the other in the course of the growing season. So if they land on a plant which is infest infected by a virus and uh, they undertake the piercing and sucking, which is similar to uh, the piercing done by a needle and then they move to a healthy plant in, in, in the course of their feeding. They have the capability to uh, transmit the, the viruses from one plant to another and that is also of economic importance to the, to the farmer. Uh, a good example is the red spider mite uh, in tomato which is very common. Uh, if you are a tomato farmer you will most likely have encountered it during the drier parts of the, of the season. And uh, especially for the ones who do irrigation, uh, the red spider mite is one of the uh, common uh, mite pests that you will encounter. Uh, another category of uh, pests is the insects. Uh, at the beginning, when, I'm, when I mention uh, a pest, you will find that it is a generic term, whereby I'm talking about anything, all the organisms. In normal language, when you talk of pests, we associate the insect type of, of pests. But uh, when you're looking at it from the bigger picture, it is uh, any organism. So uh, insects are the ones which are most common and uh, they are most rel relatable by most farmers. And uh, these are six-legged invertebrates uh, with or without the ability to fly. They might be mobile. They might be in one uh, position for a long time. Uh, some of them have the ability to fly long distances. Uh, for example, the Tuta absoluta, uh, which can fly several kilometers overnight if the currents and the winds are, are favorable to it. Uh, they mostly cause damage by either sucking, uh, similar to what the mites do. There are also pests which will uh, chew the plant, um, maybe the stems, the flowers, the leaves. An example is the caterpillars. Uh, which cause most of the damage by chewing on the on the leaves. And then uh, some of them are also uh, disease vectors, like the white, white flies and the leaf hoppers. Uh, on there, on your screen, you can see on the top uh, right is an example of a caterpillar, uh, which is a stem borer, the pink stem borer. You can see the kind of damage it, it does on maize. And uh, if they are in significant quantities on your farm, then they will uh, definitely have an impact on uh, the quality and the quantity of yield that you achieve. On the top left, you can see an example of another insect, which is the aphids, uh, and they also feed by sucking and chewing, similar to the uh, mites, and uh, they will feed on uh, the plant juices, and uh, thereby denying the plant uh, necessary uh, nutrients for development and for fruit production depending on which part of the of the plant you are interested in for harvesting. It can be either be the leaves, it can be the fruits, and in some instances, even the flowers. On the bottom left, you can see uh, an example of white flies, which are also sucking and chewing. 
you can see they are mostly aligned to the vein structure of the plant where they do the piercing and sucking. And they are also key pests because they also uh, are disease vectors for uh, particular diseases. So this is also another category of pests, which are the insects. They are the most common. And uh, the farmer should be able to understand how they behave. And by how they behave, uh, we mean by the uh, understanding the life cycle of, of that pest. So for, for pests, for insect pests, mainly they, they fall under two categories, the one that have complete metamorphosis on the left and the ones that have incomplete metamorphosis on the right. Uh, by metamorphosis, for those who may not uh, be very familiar, it, it is the life, uh, life cycle of, uh, of the insect from when it is an adult and all the way back to an adult again. So for the complete me metamorphosis, uh, you'll find mostly a good example is the beetles and the and the moth family or the butterfly family. So the adult will usually lay eggs, uh, which after a short period, depending on the species of the insect, will turn into a, a, a caterpillar. And then this caterpillar will uh, feed vigorously, and most mostly you will find that this is the damaging stage of the of the pest. So the, the butterfly uh, or the adult and the egg and the pupa are usually uh, not very damaging, uh, but the caterpillar is the one that is of interest to the farmer because uh, this one is the stage where it will cause damage. Usually the caterpillar doesn't develop just uh, directly. It has what are known as instars. So uh, it, it might start off as a small caterpillar, uh, shed off uh, its cuticle and develop into a larger caterpillar. So these are the ones that are known as instars. And the larger it gets, the more damage it can cause to the, to the plant. And then after a, feed, uh, a period of feeding, it will weave a, a, a silk cocoon. Some, some of them will use a soil. Some will use uh, plant debris to, to spin a, a cocoon where it will hibernate for a period where it now uh, changes to the adult. And that is what is referred to as a complete metamorphosis. Uh, on the other hand, there are those that undergo incomplete metamorphosis. Uh, an example there uh, is, the, is the leaf hoppers, the, the aphids, the, the cotton stainers, uh, such kind of uh, uh, insect pests. And uh, you'll notice that uh, the, once the adult lays the eggs, uh, the eggs will uh, stay for a, a short period. And then when they hatch, they hatch in, into what is known as a nymph, uh, which is a a smaller version of the adult without all the the features of an adult but it, in some cases it might be the two legs uh, instead of the six in some instances they might be missing the wings but uh, generally when you look at its morphological structure or its body structure it is very similar to an adult so as it continues to feed and uh, maybe something to note there is that the nymph which is a miniature adult, will immediately start causing damage to the plant as soon as it is uh, hatched. So the miniature adult will continue feeding and uh, will metamorph, will change in its structure to a, a larger nymph, and then uh, eventually turn into the adult. So the, there are basically three stages for these particular uh, types of pest. So you'll, when you look at the two, when you are dealing with an, uh, with, a, with an insect pest that has complete metamorphosis, the larval stage will mostly be the destructive one. Maybe apart from the beetle family where the, the beetles will also be able to feed on the, on the plant. So it can either be the adult or the adult and the larval stage which are destructive. But for the ones undergoing incomplete metamorphosis, you'll find that only the egg structure is the safe stage. The adult and the nymphs will cause equal damage uh, to the plant that you are looking at. Uh, the importance of knowing th this is that uh, as a farmer, when you are looking out for pests or insect pests on your farm, uh, once you notice the destructive stage, then you can be able to anticipate the kind of uh, losses that you can get. And it also uh, advises you on what action to take uh, at what stage. So another category of pests is the mollusks. This is the snail family. Uh, largely, people don't uh, 
associate the snails and slugs with uh, pest with, with crop damage but uh, there are a few species of the, of this particular family that uh, cause uh, significant damage to uh, our, our crops because they feed on the vegetative part of plants and uh, therefore reduce the photosynthetic area uh, they also reduce marketability of fresh vegetables because people uh, tend to to have a negative reaction to snails you can imagine when you are going to your a local grocer and you are selecting cabbages or you are selecting your local vegetables and you come across some snails then uh, it is people tend to uh, shy away from purchasing that so it, it has both uh, significance in the reduction of the quantity and also in the reduction of the quality that can be marketed uh, recently, in uh, the Moya region, they have experienced the golden apple snail, which is uh, a, a key pest nowadays in the rice fields. Because once the rice is transplanted, the snails that you can see on the top right of your screen, uh, they will feed on the young rice, uh, cutting it off and uh, causing significant damage. And you can see it lays quite a, a large mass of eggs from the picture there you can see those are almost uh, over 100 eggs and uh, once they hatch uh, in about uh, two weeks or less then you have a, a serious pr problem on your uh, rice field because they'll be damaging the young shoots and uh, therefore reduce the expected yield from your farm then uh, we also have the giant african snail uh, which also feeds on uh, vegetative uh, uh, matter uh, that is the cabbages and, uh, and and the brassica family that, that is the kale family and uh, if they are in your farm and you take no measures then you'll find that they they might they, they will cause uh, significant damage in terms of the quantity and the marketability of your uh, of your farm produce so that is another category the mites the insects the molars and then uh, we have the weeds uh, from the definition of the of a pest, uh, you can remember it is anything that uh, uh, causes damage, uh, competes with the plant for nutrients, as well as uh, is a bother to the to the farmer. So weeds are uh, a key pest. In fact, uh, in terms of significance, they are probably up there with the insects in terms of the impact they can have on your yields, because uh, they compete with the crops for water in the soil. They compete for sunlight in the uh, aerial uh, canopy and they also compete for soil nutrients uh, you'll find that weeds have uh, evolved a lot you know they are wild plants they grow naturally they don't have seed selection uh, per se and uh, they have evolved over time to be able to be effective uh, competitors since uh, agriculture began uh, you'll notice that uh, in this competitiveness they can outperform crops very fast uh, in a, let's say, for example, a maize field. By the time the maize is germinating and getting to the knee-high stage, and uh, you have left the, the plot unweeded, you'll find that the variety and uh, number of weeds will increase very fast. And uh, with the limited water and uh, soil nutrients uh, in the soil, they will be able to outperform your maize farm. So it is important that they are taken care of as early as possible to reduce this competition that uh, uh, will not enable the plant to reach its optimum productivity. Uh, some are also parasitic uh, and they affect the plant directly. For those who have uh, done farming in the Western Nyanza region, you are aware of the witchweed, which is known as triga. So it basically attaches itself to the vascular system of the plant and uh, it sucks the nutrients as they are being developed by the plant. So it is more like uh, what you can call a tick uh, in Kiswahili kupe. So it, uh, it, it directly feeds on, the, on what the plant is producing and it has a very significant effects on the productivity and the development of the maize plants. Recently, if you have been moving around, you have seen the kuskuta weed that is growing on uh, hedges. It is a yellowish, uh, stringy 
parasitic uh, weed, uh, which attaches itself to hedges and, uh, and trees. And uh, over time, it will eventually kill the, uh, the host plant uh, because it will feed mercilessly on the nutrients that the plant is, uh, uh, is producing. Another importance of the weeds is that they also harbor pests and diseases. So if you go to a, a, a weedy plot or a weedy farm, uh, the weeds will offer refuge for the pests. They offer good places for them to breed. Uh, they also harbor the diseases because uh, some you'll find that most of the diseases are not specific to one particular crop. And uh, you'll see that most of the crops that we farm, they have wild relatives. So if you might be taking good care of the pest, of the diseases and pests on your farm, but if you haven't taken care of the weeds, then that is where the pests and diseases will get refuge uh, to multiply and come back to harm your, uh, your crop. Uh, another category is uh, rodents. These are mammalian pests. So you can see the, the, the spectrum. We have come from the small red spider mites, uh, the small insects, and now we are looking at a, a huge animal, or, okay, huge in, in relative sense. So these are mammalian pests, which uh, cause damage to stored produce and also to farm structures. Um, if you have ever lived in a place where there are rats, you can uh, testify to the fact uh, of how damaging they are. For example, in uh, stored grain like uh, maize and, uh, and the likes and rice, uh, cereal crops, uh, they will cause a lot of damage to the uh, stored produce. Uh, in, the, in the process of uh, feeding, they will also create nests for uh, reproduction whereby they will lay or they will give birth to their young ones and uh, the feces and the urine from uh, the rodents will also cause uh, secondary uh, rotting of, of the of the produce that you have stored in fact if you go into a store with a heavy infestation you cannot miss the uh, distinctive uh, smell that comes from from that place in the event that there is uh, no produce that they can feed on, then they also cause damage to farm structures like the storage, the, like the storage areas. They will they will gnaw on the on this on the wood that you have used to uh, make your store, uh, weakening the the structures, and uh, that is how their economic importance comes in. So then we have the microscopic uh, pests such as fungi. Uh, and they literally feed on the plant cells, causing the loss of uh, photosynthetic area. That is if they are feeding on the leaves. Uh, for example, you can see on the top right there, there is a, a blight that is affecting a bean plant. So you can see the leaf is dying off from the feeding action of the uh, fungi. And they also cause rots on the top uh, left. You can see bean pods uh, that have been uh, affected by the molding uh, fungi. So in the course of that feeding, uh, you get to lose either the produce directly in terms of the pods or the flowers that you are intending to harvest or uh, the loss of the photosynthetic area uh, that is necessary for uh, nutrient formation for the plant. On the bottom right, you can see an example of mildew, which causes some powdery substance on the, on the leaf. So even if the sun is, uh, is, is shining bright, uh, you have enough water in the soil and enough nutrients, but you, are, you might be wondering why your crop is not performing uh, very well. So the white, surface, the white powdery su surface uh, denies the light from reaching the chlorophyll, which are the uh, food production structures in the leaf, and they are therefore denying uh, full potential for production. You'll notice that the mildews are especially important for uh, plants in the pumpkin family, the cucurbits, uh, that is the uh, uh, melons, uh, the malenge family, and the squash butternuts. So they, it, is, it is quite detrimental, and this family is very susceptible to this kind of uh, fungi. So that is another category of pests that uh, you should be knowing or you can easily identify so that you don't confuse it with uh, something else or, or uh, whatever might be affecting your, your plant. 
Then we have the category of viruses. This is also a microscopic uh, organisms. Uh, which cause systemic damage to, to plants. They, are, they affect the, the function of the cells, the normal function of the cells. And they, they are mainly spread by vectors. Uh, they are also spread by infected planting material and also during farm operations. Uh, if I may explain, as I was talking about the mites and the insects, when in the course of their feeding, they will move from plant to plant and they will carry with them uh, the viruses, which are disease causing. So uh, in, in the process, uh, you might start off with one diseased plant, but after a period of uh, vicious feeding by, by, the, by the vectors, then you'll notice that the disease is spreading. Uh, they, are, they are also spread because they are systemic and they don't die off very fast. They are also spread by infected planting material, especially for the plants that are propagated vegetatively, where you are, you are using cuttings or suckers to propagate. So if you get a sucker from an infected plant uh, that is either showing or not showing the symptoms and you plant it elsewhere, uh, the disease will continue to, prop to propagate and uh, it will deny you the uh, potential yields that you can get from that uh, particular crop. Also during farm operations like uh, pruning of the leaves uh, or during uh, weeding when you're using uh, the, the jambes or the or, or a small panga. So if you accidentally slice, or if you, for example, if it is the pruning, you are you are doing pruning, let's say for cassava, and you prune an infected plant, and then the plant juices uh, are left on the uh, pruning tools, and you proceed to an, another uninfected plant, then uh, you are able to transmit the viral disease from one plant to another. Uh, some examples of uh, significant uh, viruses of uh, importance is the tomato yellow leaf uh, virus. Uh, this one is very well known by tomato farmers because it causes the leaves to curl upwards, uh, denying them the ability to photosynthesize uh, effectively. And the plant will also show some wilting symptoms uh, despite having sufficient water and uh, sufficient nutrition. Another one of importance is the cassava mosaic virus, especially for farmers who have uh, used uh, diseased uh, planting material. You'll find that the leaves uh, become very thin, uh, they change color, and uh, they are unable to photosynthesize uh, properly. On the picture, uh, there you can see the bean common mosaic virus. You can see the variegated leaf, some areas are green, uh, some areas are uh, having a yellow uh, chlorotic area. And uh, uh, the, the yellow areas means that they have less chlorophyll. And uh, this means that they are unable to uh, photosynthesize e effectively. You can also notice the deformations on the leaf. It looks a, little, uh, a bit bumpy and it is uh, uh, curved. So uh, when you look at the plants and their morphology, the leaves are designed in, or are placed in a way that they have maximum sunlight contact to uh, increase the photosynthetic area. But the virus will, uh, once it has affected the leaves, they are unable to uh, photos photosynthesize effectively. Uh, one thing to note of importance is that they also have no cure. So it is uh, upon the farmer to ensure that the entry of the viruses on the farm is uh, is denied at all costs so that uh, it is best to avoid the entry of the of the viral disease into the farm because uh, once it is established uh, there are only a few things that you can do like uh, removal of the infected material but you cannot use any insecticides or any uh, other options uh, that require uh, application so then we also have the nematodes uh, these are also mostly microscopic uh, plant parasites. Uh, a good example is the Rushnot nematode that you can see there. On the left is, is the symptoms that you will see on the plant root system. And on the top right, you can see the uh, magnified image of, uh, of the nematodes. So once they are in the soil, they will find their way, they will burrow into the root system of, of, of the plant. Uh, you'll, you'll notice that they have a very wide host range. And once they burrow into the roots, 
they will start uh, multiplying. They are, they are feeding on the uh, nutrients that are coming from the plant, uh, from the plant uh, leaves that are being generated by the plant. And then they will also uh, get water from the roots that are as, as they are absorbing it from the from the soil. So as they as they multiply, they will form what are known as galls or root knots, and uh, this greatly affects the plant's ability to absorb uh, uh, water and nutrients uh, from the soil. And uh, if they are in significant quantities. You'll, you'll, you, the symptoms that you will see on the plant is uh, uh, wilting even in the in the presence of enough water and nutrients in the in the soil. So, any questions so far? No okay, I take. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, I, I take. Say, I say not yet. Not yet. Okay, I, I take the silence to mean no questions so far. So I'll proceed to the uh, next uh, step of the presentation. So once you have understood uh, the types of pests that you are dealing with, then that is the point whereby you can now uh, think of. Uh, acting on uh, managing them. We talk of pest management rather than uh, pest control because uh, you'll find that in almost all circumstances, you can never eliminate the pests of whichever type completely from uh, your farm. There will always be some uh, remnants within the environment. So we talk of pest management, which is uh, keeping them at a level whereby they do not have a significant imp impact on your yields or on the quality of yield that you are uh, expecting. So uh, as a good farmer who is looking at issues of sustainability, you will uh, adopt what is known as integrated uh, pest management, which is an environmental approach to crop protection, which combines uh, different pest management strategies. Uh, by pest management strategies, we are looking at uh, any operation or uh, application on the farm which will help to uh, decrease the effect or the quantity of pests uh, on your on your farm uh, we are looking at having the least possible quantity of pesticides used uh, when you talk of ipm uh, pesticides are part of the ipm uh, approach but uh, ipm is intended to ensure that the least possible uh, amount of pesticides is applied and it is only applied when and uh, where necessary. Uh, IPM is also based on the principle that cultivated plants can tolerate certain levels of injury uh, without uh, significant economical uh, or yield losses. So uh, when you look at the natural world, there is an ecosystem balance that exists. Uh, when you go to the game parks, the, there is the food, the food chain where the gazelles will feed on the grass, the lions will feed on the, the hyenas will feed on the uh, gazelles, and then the lions will kill the hyenas and the other predators to reduce the competition. So there is the apex predator and then there is the, uh, the foundation uh, uh, organism, which is the one that is uh, supporting the ecosystem. And the same... Um, uh, principle can be applied to the farm, whereby we have the natural enemies uh, in the farm, and uh, if left to coexist, then you'll find that up to a certain point, uh, there, there'll be some injuries that will be experienced, but they won't have a significant effect on the uh, eventual yields uh, or the eventual uh, quality of the yields depending on which crop you are uh, growing because some have high tolerance and some have low tolerance to uh, the pests. So when you talk of IPM on the left there you can see uh, the IPM cycle uh, which begins with pest identification which we have uh, just covered in terms of knowing which particular pest and which category it falls into and uh, its potential threat to your production. So once you identify it and you get to know 
a few things about it. Uh, what is the most destructive stage of the pest? Uh, what is the most vulnerable stage of the pest for uh, for you to take action? Uh, how 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 fast do they multiply? Uh, where do they hide? Uh, what are their alternate hosts? Uh, all these kinds of things. You need to know all that about your pest when you are doing the identification. And then this is followed by prevention uh, where possible. So you will prevent the entry of the pest into the farm at, at all costs. Because uh, if the pest is not in your farm, then it means that it is not bothering you. And then uh, if, uh, if the eventuality, which is almost almost the case, when it enters, then you will begin the monitoring phase uh, by scouting. You will look out uh, in your farm and see are the populations increasing, uh, and you can know this by either physical presence of the pest or by the levels of damage that you're noticing on your farm. So the monitoring is to advise you on whether you need to take action or not. In the event that you need to take action, then you will choose from the options that I will talk about next, uh, which can either be biological, uh, chemical, cultural, or uh, mechanical, mechanical stroke, physical. So you'll choose the options that will suit you, and then you will act by implementing those options, and then eventually evaluate and uh, see whether the options that you have chosen are working. And then uh, you'll proceed back to uh, monitoring and uh, taking other options if necessary, if the options you have un undertaken uh, are not working. So uh, IPM has some peculiarities or some, uh, uh, can I say, characteristics. Uh, it is not a fixed uh, package whereby you can copy and paste from one farm to the other. It is dependent on the agroecological zone you're working in, the crops, that you are growing, the history of the area, uh, what is happening in your neighborhood, what your fellow farmers are growing and how they are managing their pests. So it is not a fixed package that you can just uh, copy and paste from one farm to the other. It requires uh, customization to your particular uh, settings. And then you can only be said to be practicing IPM if you are using a combination of uh, suitable techniques uh, to minimize the pest levels. And uh, it is an integral part of crop production and uh, farm management. You can, uh, in most cases, you might be undertaking some uh, one of the uh, some component or the other of IPM. But if it is done in an intentional manner, that is when it is considered to be uh, IPM proper. It's not uh, uh, some trial and error things that are sometimes done. So you have to think about it at the beginning of the season and uh, maintain up to the uh, yields or the harvesting uh, period. It also considers the economics of pest management decisions. You are looking at uh, what are the most cost-effective options that are available and uh, what can um, maintain or guarantee you the quality and the quantity you are targeting. So uh, eventually, it also supports the correct timing and application of pesticides. Uh, IPM does not mean that you are not using uh, pesticides, but for when you are doing the timing and the application of pesticides, you have to be considerate that uh, some of the other options that you are using under IPM might require that you use either selective or soft pesticides that will coexist uh, with the other management options. Uh, monitoring and scouting is also very key uh, under the surveillance or the uh, evaluation of uh, IPM. And for effective IPM, you need the monitoring and scouting. You need the following tools. You have to have a record keeping system so that you can be able to uh, take note of uh, what is happening, whether the pest uh, incidences are increasing or decreasing or they are stagnant. You must also have some scouting sheets uh, you, you should also have a hand lens of at least 10 times magnification. Sometimes you might need to inspect the, the crop and uh, you can see that some of the insect pests are, uh, are microscopic or uh, they are quite minute. So you, you need some magnification lens to uh, inspect the, the, the plant parts that uh, might be affected or where they, you suspect the pests are hiding. Uh, in some instances, you might need some uh, to, to undertake some diagnostic 
uh, uh, can I say diagnostic uh, processes in the in the lab or uh, away from the farm. So you might need to take away some samples. For example, when you want to differentiate some bacterial pests from uh, uh, fungal pests. So you might need to take some samples for further analysis. So in, in such instances, you need some bags that you can carry the samples away with. Uh, for some of the pests that do not migrate very fast, like the nematodes, you might need some hotspot markers to show you where uh, the pests have been seen, have been, uh, have been identified, and uh, where you, you are uh, seeing uh, or you expect an increase in population or an increase in damage. So that the next time you are doing your a scouting visit, you can know where uh, previously uh, some hotspots had been identified. You might also need some sticky traps for the pests which are very shy or are nocturnal because you cannot do scouting in the night. So you might uh, set up some traps to uh, identify the, the pests as well. Uh, sweep nets to also catch the pests. Uh, for, for ease of identification, you must uh, capture the pest and uh, uh, scrutinize it under the hand lens. So sweep nets come in very handy. And then the white paper boards uh, are also important, for example, for the trips, so that you can be able to identify the exact uh, type of uh, pest that, uh, or the trip that you are uh, infested with in your, in your farm. So those are some of the uh, tools that are necessary because uh, scouting is not just moving around the farm. It, is, it involves the identification of the pest as well. So there are, there are three scouting patterns. You can uh, use the zigzag pattern, whereby you are moving in and out of the various sections of the farm. You can use the boundary scouting, where you are moving on the outside part of the, the perimeter of the farm. And you can use uh, spot scouting, whereby if the, you have identified a hot spot, you can go back there and uh, see whether the pest is increasing or decreasing in that particular area. And uh, it is also advisable to have uh, uh, markers for each scouting point so that you are able to go back to the exact place where you scouted last time and see uh, whether there is in incremental or decrease in the diseases. So there are about four control methods that are available in IPM. They are the cultural, uh, options or the cultural methods of pest control, the physical uh, pest control methods, biological pest management methods, and the chemical ones. So for the cultural methods, uh, these are usually what is usually or routinely done in in, uh, in, in crop management. They, in some instances, they can also be considered as good agricultural practice. So they might have other benefits apart from pest management. You'll find that they might increase the quality and quantity of your uh, yield in the absence or in the presence of pests. So they have some, uh, the ones that are mentioned here have some significance in terms of reducing the uh, pest population uh, on your farm. So things like uh, crop rotation, it is always advisable to uh, rotate the families of, of uh, crops that you are growing, especially for the annual ones, so that uh, you can reduce the pest pressure. Uh, field sanitation before, uh, during, and after harvesting is also very important because you are, you are, you are re reducing the inoculum or the disease and pest materials from your farm. So once you take good field sanitation, you are able to break the, crop, the pest cycle and thereby improve on uh, or, or reduce the pest pressure. Uh, intercropping some, when you intercrop some, some plants, uh, some have an antagonistic effect on the uh, pests. Uh, some have some uh, protective uh, properties. For example, if you plant a cover crop uh, alongside maize, uh, let's say for example, the cowpeas, uh, they will suppress weeds by the fact that they are growing uh, as a cover crop. So those interdependent uh, properties uh, have some effect on uh, the pest pressure on your farm. Uh, the same with um, using uh, live mulch. Uh, it will also assist in reducing the weeds and also 
reducing the pupation of some of the pests so that the instead of the pupa getting to burrow in the soil they are exposed and uh, you get to take advantage of the birds or the lizards eating the pupae of the particular pest you can also do roguing which is the removal of infested plant material uh, from the farm as it grows to avoid uh, it spreading to the other non-infected plants uh, crop spacing is also important especially for the fungal and viral diseases so that there is enough uh, space between one plant and the other to avoid the development of a microclimate which is suitable for uh, pest and disease uh, development uh, variety selection is also an important thing nowadays, uh, especially with the advent of hybrid seeds and uh, tolerant uh, and resistant varieties. So you can start off with a resistant variety so that even in the presence of the pest, your crop yields and quality are not compromised. Uh, the same thing for site selection is very important. In the event that uh, you are not able to undertake crop rotation, especially for the smallholder farmers. Uh, the, the site where you choose to plant a certain crop uh, might have a significant impact on the uh, crop, on the pests and diseases that you will encounter. So when you undertake these things in combination, uh, they have some other benefits to the crop in terms of uh, competition. But when you do this intentionally, uh, from the beginning of the season, then you give your crop a good head start in terms of pest management. Yeah, then we have the physical methods of uh, pest management. Uh, there's the use of plastic mulch in the, when you're growing high value uh, vegetable crops and, or flower crops, then uh, you have seen some people use the plastic mulch over the, uh, see, of, of, on the plant beds. So these ones will prevent the development of weeds and also they prevent the pupation of, uh, of insect pests. Then there's also deep tillage, which exposes the pupa and uh, the sedentary or the in, uh, hibernating uh, structures of some of the diseases to, to, to the sun, which uh, for the sun to burn them and uh, render them ineffective. So deep tillage is also quite a, a good approach. Then you have the burning, uh, burning of uh, the farm, especially for the ones who are doing things like uh, sorghum and millet. You'll see that they do a lot of burning, but you can reduce the weed pressure and also burn the uh, residual insect pests that are on that farm. Uh, for some pests, you can do hand picking, especially for crops that are maybe, let's say, grown in a greenhouse. You can do hand picking or, or in a small area, whereby during the course of scouting, you can uh, pick out the pest itself, and you are almost sure that uh, you are reducing the numbers on your farm. You can also use mechanical traps, that is the light traps, the water traps, and the sticky traps to trap the insects. And in so doing, you are, you are reducing the quantity of the pests that are in your farm. Uh, the most uh, used are the blue and yellow sticky traps for uh, aphids and uh, thrips, respectively. And they have a good uh, catch rate, whereby if they are spread out effectively, you can be able to control the thrips and the aphids without in some instances, even relying on the pesticides. Then there's the hand weeding, then there's the bagging of fruits, whereby as soon as the fruit emerges, for example, in some countries, and it is also slowly catching pace in Kenya, whereby once the banana emerges, it is bagged in, uh, in a way to prevent the thrips from attacking it and thereby protecting it mechanically from the pests. And then we have the shade nets and the greenhouses, which are basically structures that are meant to keep away uh, the pests. They might be effective for some categories of insect pests, but uh, you'll find that if you do not undertake disinfection, then uh, you might be infested and create a good environment for the development of other pests. So it is uh, up to the farmer to take the necessary measures to ensure that uh, the pests are prevented from entering. 
Then we have the biological methods. These are the use of uh, natural enemies uh, in the environment. So for example, you have the parasitoids. Uh, these are insects which will uh, lay their eggs on uh, the insect pest. Uh, an example is the parasitic wasps that lays its eggs in the aphids uh, of cabbage. And in, in so doing, uh, they will significantly reduce the number of aphids that are in circulation. So uh, if you are able to maintain an, a balanced ecosystem whereby the parasitic wasps are not killed off by the harsh pesticides, then they, at the beginning of the season, uh, the parasitic wa wa wasps will do a lot of uh, work for you by eliminating the, uh, the aphids for you. Uh, not only the aphids, they also do that in caterpillars. So, and they are very good at hunting, hunting out the, their hosts. So if you are creating a balanced ecosystem, leaving an unplowed strips or uh, intercropping, uh, you will, you'll be able to get uh, a good population of the, the parasitoids, which will uh, greatly keep the uh, threshold levels of some of the pests below economic level. Then we have the predators, which is a, uh, an example is shown there of a ladybird, uh, which is feeding on a, on, a, on an aphid. So these are the insects that feed on other insects. An example is the pre, uh, ladybird. We also have the praying mantis, and uh, we also have the spiders. Uh, they, they play quite a crucial role in a, in a balanced ecosystem. You'll find that they significantly keep the pest population low, especially if you're not using harsh chemicals. And then we have the use of plant extracts like neem, uh, which are derived from, from plant uh, substances, and they have anti-pesticidal uh, or they have pesticidal effects. Uh, they are quite natural and uh, they, ha they, they have low toxicity to animals and, uh, and uh, humans. So uh, you can use them as well to uh, control the, the pests on your, on, on your farm. And then we have the pathogens like the Metarhizium fungi, uh, which, which, are, which are pathogens of, of insects. Uh, they will feed on the cuticle and uh, thus reduce the ability of the pest to cause, cause damage to your, to your crops. Uh, you'll notice that for most of these biological methods, uh, they are uh, slow acting. They do not act very fast. Uh, and farmers have to be patient when you are using biological methods. Uh, you should be consistent in their application and uh, expect the results in maybe up to three weeks in some instances for you to see the uh, significant changes. And that is why it is advisable to take advantage of them very early in the season before the uh, pest population is uh, increasing. Uh, I think there's an error there. It is not supposed to be fruit bugging. It is supposed to be pheromone traps. So pheromone traps are also a form of biological control, whereby you use the uh, female for pheromones to attract the males, and then they are either uh, stuck on the trap itself or you have uh, used some pesticides so that when they come close uh, they are killed uh, by the pesticide so it's a combination of both biological and uh, uh, pesticidal uh, method uh, finally we have the pest the pesticides that uh, we can use to uh, as a last resort or uh, with minimal uh, usage on the farm. Uh, if you're using IPM, it is expected that you will use them judiciously to either bring down a fast rising population or to prevent the establishment of the pests within your, within your farm. Uh, as opposed to what is currently being done, whereby uh, farmers undertake calendar sprays uh, without scouting in, in most instances. So uh, it increases the costs unnecessarily as well as uh, impacting on on the uh, on the environmental balance uh, whereby ipm requires that balance for it to uh, work effectively so we have uh, the meticides which are supposed to take care of the mites uh, we have the insecticides which are supposed to take care of the insect family 
So when you are reading your pesticide label and it says insecticide, it is for use on insects. And then we have the herbicides, which are supposed to work on the weeds. Uh, they, are, they can either be selective or non-selective. Selective meaning that it will only kill a certain uh, variety or group of, of uh, weeds. And non-selective are those ones that will kill uh, all plant material on the farm. And then we have the fungicides, uh, which will take care of the fungal diseases. These are, the fungal diseases are, uh, are quite broad. Uh, you can see the difference between the blights and the powdery mildews. So not every fungicide will, let's say, take care of the mildews. And, and not every fungicide will take care of the blights or the anthracnose. Uh, so you have to be quite uh, proactive and uh, know the kind of fungicide that is needed on your particular farm after you have done uh, you are scouting and then you have the nematicides which will kill uh, the nematodes uh, they, are, they are mostly soil applied and uh, they will assist you in the reduction of the population of uh, nematodes uh, asante sana for your attention and uh, maybe i can take some questions now Thank you, Benson. Okay, I can see from the chat uh, there's a question. Are there cultural organic ways that can completely control pests and without use of uh, synthetics? Uh, okay, it, it will mostly depend on the plant that you are, you are growing and the quality that your market is uh, demanding for. Because uh, for the current kind of market system where we are working with, whereby uh, we are doing commercial agriculture, it is uh, almost impossible to do that uh, without the synthetics. If you are growing a small uh, portion of the farm, then it is possible to use, uh, to go 100% organic, organic. But uh, once a certain threshold is passed, then it becomes uh, very hard for you to produce organically and uh, economically because you'll find that the costs will be too high for you to manage the pests and uh, the returns will not be uh, commensurate with that. Uh, for the mollusks, uh, the, there is one active ingredient that has been uh, registered for the control of the golden apple snail. Uh, but for the normal garden snails, you don't even have to go for synthetic pesticides, it's just uh, a mix of sodium chloride, which is the, your common salt, is sufficient to, uh, uh, to control them. And uh, they are also highly attracted to alcohol, alcoholic uh, beverages, uh, mostly the beers. So if you can set a water trap with the alcoholic uh, beers, a shallow trap, then uh, you are able to attract them and you can uh, be able to eliminate them uh, on your farm. Back to you, Gideon. Uh, they, there was also another question hmm. on the chat. Uh, I can read it for you. Yes. Would you advise other planting media besides uh, soil for crop protection or pest control? Yes. Uh... Okay, the use of alternative media for propagation is all dependent on the cropping system that you have adopted. If you go for high value crops that, uh, by high value meaning that the uh, produce that you are getting from that farm fetches uh, quite high prices in the market or is destined for uh, a niche market that is ready to pay premium prices, then you can invest in alternate media such as peat, and a cocoa pit, uh, or even doing uh, soil fumigation, or even hydroponics, which are quite uh, significant capital expenditures or capital investments. So the advantage is that uh, it's easier to manage some of the 
uh, soil borne diseases and, uh, so, and soil borne pests. And uh, you can also com uh, uh, control the nutrition level for the, for the plant much more easily. So these are um, uh, intensive uh, agricultural practices. And I, I would not uh, see someone doing them uh, on a very large scale, especially when it is an open field and it is for uh, common uh, crops that are for the local or the normal market. So these are quite niche uh, production systems, but yes, they can be done and uh, they have an impact on uh, disease management, especially for the soil borne uh, diseases and pests. Thank you very much for that response. Uh, there is also another question. Uh, so this one is from me. Mm -hmm. So uh, farmers have had uh, some advisors talk to them and tell them that to minimize pest infestation, that they can always plant crops that are in season. And you find out that currently with the climate change issue, uh, the issue of water and the erratic rainfall patterns, mm. you find that it's quite hard for someone to adhere to the calendar that we used to use for farming. Mm. So anyone can just plant any crop at any time. Mm. If, uh, so long as they raise it uh, through irrigation. So mm. what is your advice when it comes to that? Okay. So uh, it will, okay, planting in season crops has, uh, uh, can I say, some significance when it comes to certain pests. And uh, the, the first disease that comes to mind or the first uh, thing that comes to mind was the maize lethal necrosis virus that attacked the country sometimes uh, around 2015, 16, there about when it was first seen. So uh, the, one of the cultural practices that was advised was that uh, to have a closed season whereby everyone was to plant the maize uh, at around the same time, harvest at around the same time, and then leave a closed season where there was no uh, maize to act as an alternate host for the disease because it was caused by a combination of two viruses. And uh, after the farmers adopted that, the disease came down and uh, uh, it is no longer of huge significance. And the farmers who experience it know how uh, to control it. So planting in season has its uh, own advantages. But when, when you have correctly put it that the seasons are very erratic, <laughs> then it means that the farmers have to be more keen on the, the uh, meteorological predictions on, on the rain and uh, adapt accordingly. They can also adapt accordingly by using tolerant crops, uh, such as the water efficient maize, if you are talking about maize, uh, short, short uh, or fast maturing varieties, especially in areas where, or the, where the rain is low, or the, the weather forecast has indicated that the rains might not be sufficient because you'll notice that water stressed plants tend to be more susceptible to uh, pests and, and diseases. When it comes to irrigation, then the farmers uh, have the discretion of choosing when and, uh, and, and how to plant. So uh, if they are to practice IPM, then there has to be can I say concerted efforts between farmers? If you do not have a, a, a sufficient isolation distance, uh, which can be uh, as short as 100 meters for some crops and uh, up to a, a kilometer for some crops when it comes to the types of pests that they are experiencing. So if you, you cannot talk to your farmers and agree on a good calendar, then it means that uh, you will all be individually affected and. Uh, uh, collectively uh, affected by the pests uh, of that particular crop. Let's say, for example, in mind here, I'm thinking of uh, plants like tomatoes and beans. Uh, they have a relatively short isolation distance, but if you're practicing IPM on your farm, then you would expect your neighbors to also undertake similar uh, interventions so as to make it work. If you remember 
uh, it is not a copy and paste uh, thing. It has to be a collective effort uh, by the whole community, or meaning the farms that are surrounding you, as well as customized to your farm uh, as well. Yeah. Thank you very much. We, uh, as you know, we also have uh, some member, some people who are following us on Facebook. So from there, I can see some comments and also we have a question from there. I can mm -hmm. also pose it to you. So it is state, uh, please explain in detail on tutor cycle and its control at every stage. I think yeah, someone, someone wants to know that. Okay. Uh, tutor is uh, also known as uh, the tomato leaf miner, and uh, it is uh, an, a nocturnal pest. So it is very active uh, at night. That is when it is uh, most active. It is from the Lepidoptera family. Uh, that is the moth and the butterfly family. And they have the characteristic in that they are able to uh, undergo complete metamorphosis. That is, they, they lay the eggs, uh, the eggs hatch into the uh, caterpillar, which is the most active uh, or which is the most destructive. And then from there, it, it pupates in the soil and in plant debris. And then from uh, there, it uh, the cycle is, is is completed. So when you look at tutor, uh, it is a fast. Uh, it has a short life cycle, especially in warm climates, uh, as short as uh, twenty. Uh, is it twenty four to twenty seven days? Uh, the life cycle can can be complete. They also lay a lot of eggs on the underside of the leaves, and uh, also on the stem nodes and some also on the plant debris on the on the soil so you, from this you can tell that it is a the populations can increase very very fast within a very short period of time also of note for tutor is the fact that they they are also polyphagous they they will feed on uh, a, 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 a great a, a huge host of uh, plants and not only the tomato, but the preferred one is the is, is the tomato. So that uh, in the absence of the tomato, they will not exactly go extinct, but they will uh, feed on other and uh, on other uh, on other plants as they wait for the uh, tomato, which is their preferred host. So with that in mind, uh, control can be done uh, in several uh, several ways. One of them is uh, plant uh, field hygiene. Uh, when you have a crop of uh, tomato, uh, at the end of it, it is very important that you uh, collect the debris that is uh, arising from the uh, farm and uh, possibly even burn it because you'll find that it, it will be hosting the eggs, it will be hosting uh, the larvae, it will also host, be hosting some of the adults. So it is important that you you, you burn uh, the, the the plant debris that is uh, 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 from from the particular farm. Uh, also, intercropping is very important for the uh, tomato plant uh, for the control of tutor. It is not very. Uh, it's not the can I say what the silver bullet, but you will find that. The tutor pest is polyphagous, as I said. It, it eats a whole variety of pests. But if you if you uh, crop rotate with none, they are known as the Solanaceous family, the Solanaceae family. That is the tomatoes, the black nightshade, the brinjals or the eggplant, uh, the the managu family. If you if you, if you rotate with uh, pests uh, with plants that are not in that family, then uh, you have a, you stand a better chance of uh, reducing the infestation after two or three seasons because the population will have uh, reduced. And then uh, you can also use the uh, traps, the pheromone traps. 
they are significant for monitoring uh, to know if the tutor is already on your farm or the, they are also significant if you have if you have the ability you can also use them uh, in in quantities in large quantities to to mass trap the uh, the tutor that is around you uh, the disadvantage of using the traps is that if your fellow farmers are not taking the necessary precautions then you will find that uh, you will attract uh, the tutor to your farm as opposed to being able to control them so it is important for you to choose the uh, right time for the for the mass mass trapping and then uh, you can also remove the alternate hosts as i've said uh, it is polyphagous there is uh, the common weed that is known as datura it grows in so many areas uh, you can also remove the potato especially if you are growing your tomato and uh, in, in the neighborhood there is some potato then you stand a, a chance of having a lot of tutor infestation so it is important that you reduce the solanaceous families uh, weeds and volunteer crops to ensure that the alternate hosts uh, the tutor does not get alternate uh, uh, hosts for reproduction and for further inf infestation uh, as a last resort if you see the populations are, are growing because the tutor is quite destructive it will feed on the leaves it will feed on the stems it will feed on the fr young fruits as well as the older fruits so it causes damage uh, a lot of damage at all stages of crop development so it's important that you can uh, use the recommended uh, pesticides but when it comes to pesticides try and use the ones with the least toxicity uh, that is the ones with the blue or the green uh, color band uh, on your farm uh, as you approach uh, harvesting then you should also use the pesticides that have a low uh, pre-harvest uh, interval so that uh, the residues do not uh, end up on the harvested or on the ripe uh, tomatoes yeah that that is the advice i can give so far in terms of uh, tutor absoluta uh, when it comes to uh, open fields i uh, if it if it had uh, a tutor infestation and you have done your crop rotation then it is also important that you uh, do deep tillage so that you can expose any pupae that might have been harbored in the in, in the farm uh, from the alternate hosts uh, in some instances uh, if uh, there was a lot of pupa then burning could also be of, of assistance uh, to reduce the initial quantity of pests that uh, are there on your farm thank you uh, thank you so much uh, for that i think it was very clear trying to check whether there are some other questions that I've, I've probably I'm not seeing. But uh, if not, I still have another question, especially on uh, fruit flies. Fruit flies as a pest. Mm. Mm. Uh, you find that uh, farmers and especially the growing areas, and I would like to be specific, for instance, uh, in the case of uh, mangoes, mangoes. Mm. you find that fruit fly is a challenge. Mm. Even after undertaking some, like integrating IPM, mm. uh, it's still a challenge and also powdery mildew. Mm. Uh, which is the best way or probably a combination of ways other than directly going for the pesticides. Mm. Uh, there have been many, 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 many uh, advices around that, that mm. ensuring that the trees are not bushy. Mm. Any, but could you, could you uh, extrapolate on that? Okay. So for the, I'll, I'll start with the powdery mildew because it is the easier one to manage. Uh, what farmers don't realize is that uh, powdery mildew for for you to become of significance it is when it affects the flower buds 
And uh, if your flower buds are affected, then there is a heavy uh, flower abortion, and this reduces the quali the quantity of fruits that you can get from your mango tree. So uh, the the mango farmers, someone who is keen on mango farming, will know the the annual cycle. Being being a perennial crop, it is in the same place, the same uh, and uh, in the same year. So once the blooming season starts that is when uh, it is the most appropriate to start uh, control for powdery mildew uh, unfortunately i only know of the uh, chemicals or the pesticides that can be used i'm not aware of uh, other cultural practices but uh, Okay, one cultural practice is pruning because it reduces the, uh, it enhances the air circulation and light penetration. But then at the beginning of the season, that is when it's best to apply uh, the products for powdery mildew. If you apply a, a, a good product, you apply it well with uh, the correct equipment, then it will serve you, it will serve the purpose for the remainder of the season without having to undertake repeat uh, applications. So that is what I can say about powdery mildew. It is all about the timing and uh, application of the correct uh, pesticide, as well as uh, pruning uh, in the off season so that uh, there is light penetration as well as uh, reduction of uh, development of a microclimate. Uh, when it comes to the fruit flies, you notice that there are several uh, species of fruit flies that uh, affect our farmers. There's the certain Ceratitis, if I, I, I ceratitis, yes, that is the word. Ceratitis. It's uh, there's ceratitis, and then there's Bactrocera, uh, which are all also found in uh, in our mango growing zones. So, uh, and here is now where the farmers are uh, advised to undertake uh, IPM uh, seriously, because by using mechanical traps, uh, those are the most uh, effective method of uh, controlling the the fruit flies. Uh, when you go to these areas, uh, there are several organizations which have uh, developed various, uh, can I say, indigenous knowledge on how to develop the, the traps and using uh, several, uh, can I say, attractants that will attract the, uh, the fruit flies to the, to the traps. So the, some of the ones that are sold commercially will have uh, eugenol uh, or, or, or similar baits that are very attractive to the, uh, to the fruit flies. You can also use uh, a ripe fruit of either banana or a mango or because the, the two have very distinct uh, aromas that will attract the fruit fly. And then within the trap, they will, uh, they will put either some small uh, pesticides, quantity of pesticides, or they can use uh, uh, what's it called uh, vinegar uh, also as an attractant. So the traps are quite simple to to produce uh, or to uh, build in uh, at the farm level, whereby you'll have the attractant at the top, and then the uh, the killer liquid at the bottom, and then you have punctured some holes to attract the uh, the fruit fly from where once it lands, it is killed. Uh, if you can be able to have at least two traps per plant, because if you are close to the resources and uh, depending on the size of the orchard, if you can have a, a, a trap for every uh, tree, then you will find that it uh, offers quite a significant uh, pest, uh, pest reduction. Uh, for others, they have uh, you, they have been able to use. Excuse me, they have been able to use commercial baits. This uh, this is a sticky substance that is painted on the branches of the of the plant. It will attract, and once the fruit fly lands on it, it it, it dies. Uh, in some countries, they have tried to use the sterile mill technique. Uh, I think in Kenya, we, it, it has been uh, piloted, but it has not been adopted full scale, whereby the sterile male is introduced to the population and it, uh, subsequent populations are rendered sterile. Therefore, the population is uh, greatly uh, reduced. 
So those are some of the ways in which uh, some are very practical, some are uh, a bit experimental, and uh, depending on the size of your farm, uh, the farmer can be able to choose uh, which one to, to adopt. But the uh, fruit fly trap uh, so far is the most uh, effective one. In the course of the season, uh, you'll notice that the mangoes do not all ripen at the same time. So if there's any fruit fall, uh, you'll notice that the, one of the uh, symptoms of the fruit fly is uh, the fruit drop. Uh, the the uh, mango that is affected will fall down and it will have some maggots inside it. So it's important to maintain field hygiene uh, by going and collecting all the fruits that have dropped and uh, immersing them in water to suffocate the, uh, the, the fruit flies. Uh, others will also dig a, a relatively deep uh, hole from where they can cover it with soil and uh, suffocate the fruit flies as well. But the one for using water is more practical, especially if you have access to water, because it is less labor intensive. Yeah, that's the advice I can give on that. Thank you so much uh, for the response. Uh, I can see that we have other two questions and I will read them to you and then you can um, decide on which one you will go first with. Mm -hmm. So there is uh, one here that says, uh, this one is from Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, I have seen people use soil on maize to control fall armyworms. What's your take on this? That's the first one. And then there's another one uh, could you comment on any successful area wide control programs for persistent and highly mobile pests, taking into account farmers tend to work in isolation? Mm -hmm. Did you get them? Okay, yes, I get again. The first one is soil for fall and home control, and then the second one is an instance of area wide uh, control for pests. Uh, considering farmers uh, work in isolation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think I'll go with the first one. Uh, when it comes to the use of soil for fall and worm control, uh, it is what I can call, uh, okay, it's, it, it can either fall under cultural or uh, physical control. Uh, if you are dealing with a young maize plant that is at the knee high or the, thereabout, and you pour the soil into the funnel of the maize. Uh, it has been reported that it offers some level of control, not uh, effect, not uh, very effective, but it offers some effective uh, control. And from the literature I've read, the science behind it is that the soil uh, suffocates the worm or the caterpillar that is uh, hiding in the in the funnel. So as it tries to make its way out to feed at night, it is hindered and uh, it, it offers some level of control. Not very effective, but at least it uh, slows down the, uh, the damage that can be caused by the caterpillar. Uh, on the area-wide control, uh, what I'm aware of is that uh, the only area-wide uh, control that has been successful is for strategic pests. And by strategic pests, I'm talking about the desert locusts, uh, the quelea birds, and uh, the, the African armyworm. And these are taken care of by mostly by the government, the, the Desert Locust Control Organization, mm -hmm. and the Plant Protection and Food Safety Directorate, which are responsible for, for this. And you can see that these are pests which are beyond the uh, control of, or the management of one farmer. It is an area-wide uh, approach that uh, is taken. So there is either aerial spraying or, or baiting and, uh, and killing uh, for these pests. But when it comes to pests like uh, the fruit fly, uh, there was a campaign in uh, Makueni County to introduce a fruit fly flea, eh? fruit fly free pest zone, whereby uh, there was a mass training of the farmers, there was a subsidized uh, introduction of the fruit fly traps, 
uh, the success rate of which uh, is still being evaluated because it was started uh, about two years ago. So the evaluation is still ongoing and it takes quite quite a while uh, as per the CAFIS uh, protocols to, to, uh, to declare a, a, an area to be pest free. So that is still work in progress, uh, but with concerted efforts and uh, the use of spray service providers and community uh, farmer advisors, then uh, it is possible because there has been some significant reduction in losses from the fruit fly in these areas as per the uh, most recent interaction I've had with farmers from that area. Yeah, that's the uh, information I can give at the moment. Thank you so much, Mr. Benson. I can see that our time uh, actually it's up. And so I appreciate uh, your response in the presentation. Mm -hmm. And also then that joined us. So to wrap up, I invite uh, the chairman Soka Msariki to wrap up, please. All right, um, thank you. Thank you, Gideon. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, being with us throughout the, the session. It's been very, very informative from uh, hearing from Benson and Gigi from uh, CropLife and of course, um, getting some very practical insights on uh, pest and disease management. And Benson, thank you for bringing out in a very clear manner the, the, the manner in which one can uh, integrate um, different control strategies. That was uh, very, very informative. Of course, with very good detail on, um, on, on, on how some of these pests uh, behave and uh, what we need to be aware of so that we can actually effectively uh, combat them. So um, for those who have been following us, and of course, as we, we pay attention to this particular subject of uh, pest control, um, I am sure we are you know, much better for uh, the experience, you know, considering um, the current uh, situation whereby we are all keen that we'd want to use um, fewer pesticides on our, on our foods and much as we're in the tropics and we know that um, pests are rather aggressive uh, and we cannot completely eliminate pesticides. I think this session was very informative in giving us um, uh, insights, practical insights on how to uh, utilize um, other technologies and other uh, control techniques. And it is all about integrating them. It is about making them work um, based on information. I think that that is one major takeaway that if you must be armed with information um, of the right manner, you have to be aware of your cropping calendar. You have to be aware of activities that are happening uh, around you and so that you can plan uh, accordingly. So thank you so much, uh, Benson. Actually, Benson Gigi is the, the last speaker in this session of our master classes. Um, we will be coming back um, after a break in uh, mid, mid this month, whereby we will be coming back to these topics and we'll be examining some of the uh, field best issues and field best challenges. So of course, we will be looking forward to much more interaction with you and we'll be having panel panelists that will be discussing um, the practical uh, challenges and the practical issues around these topics that we have had the principles expounded on so very clearly. So please look out for, uh, for that. And of course, as we now are into the month of uh, June, we are also looking forward to the World Food Safety Day that is going to be marked on the 7th of June. Um, a day when we celebrate and uh, actually amplify the issues around food safety. And in particular this year, we will be looking at standards as drivers for food safety. So I urge all of us to be on the lookout for information around that. It will be available on the SOCA uh, masterclass and of course, um, other social media platforms. Last but not least, again, just emphasizing that as we talk of plant protection, uh, food safety, we are looking at um, ways in which to make our farming systems resilient. We are trying to look at ways in which we can utilize the different technologies and um, uh, production uh, techniques and, and systems so that 
in the face of the climate uh, change issues, we can be more resilient and um, definitely more sustainable in our, in our crop production. And towards that end, uh, SOCA is, is keenly uh, involved both with the space of advocacy, but also with provision of technical support towards um, sustainable uh, agriculture systems such as uh, agroecology um, or regenerative agriculture or conservation agriculture. And so we do call on you to reach out to us using our different uh, con uh, contacts and we will be glad to uh, reach out and give you more information on the same. So with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to wish you all a good evening or a good afternoon, depending on where you are. Thank you for joining us and for being part of this masterclass. Asanteni Sana. Back to you, Gideon. Thank you so much uh, for the remarks. And I would like to thank everyone uh, for joining us and uh, see you next time for the next masterclass. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, Benson. Um, most welcome. Probably, Benson, I, I hope that you've uh, said whatever you really needed. Did you have any parting shot? Uh, no, just to thank Soka for the platform to educate farmers and uh, the general public on uh, pesticides and, uh, and pest management. So uh, looking forward to the next session where I can also be a part of the audience and learn more from others. Thank you, Gideon and Soka. Okay, we are welcome. So this session is uh, closed. Thank you.